So what I'm going to talk about today is a line of research we've been developing over the last seven years or so called active efficient coding. And uh, what fascinated me or has fascinated me for many years now is how to build um, systems, robots, that can learn more autonomously than right, uh, what we see in, in today's artificial intelligence for the most part. And a big inspiration, of course, is the development of infants. An infant doesn't need to be like spoon-fed with millions of labeled training examples, but will happily, over the course of months, uh, develop all sorts of skills, uh, focusing here on some visual skills, and that doesn't require much or almost any real supervision in the, in the uh, sense of uh, supervised learning as it's used in machine learning. Um, so ultimately it would be nice to understand how this kind of process works and to be able to build machines that can learn in a similarly autonomous fashion. And um, I think um, various speakers have sort of alluded to this before me, of course. So, and a central part of this is how a developing agent can learn a good model of the world. And we've been turning to information theory for this, uh, because information theory gives us a general theory for how to learn representations, how to uh, compress information, store information um, effectively. And this has been developed many, many years ago by Claude Shannon after the uh, Second World War, but it didn't take long before the ideas from information theory actually swept over to neuroscience and people have uh, developed what we call the efficient coding hypothesis, which basically says that biological sensory systems should look at the statistical properties of the sensory signals and exploit redundancies to encode information as compactly and efficiently as possible. So this goes back to Atneef, uh, famously Barlow, and has been a sort of big driving force in trying to understand sensory systems in neuroscience. And uh, um, a modern variant of these ideas are so-called sparse coding algorithms, uh, where the idea is that right, we want to learn representations where for any particular thing we want to encode, we only want to use or only want to have a few neurons active so we can, we can save energy, because energy uh, efficiency is a big issue for the brain. And formally speaking, I don't know who of you is how familiar with information theory. If, if you're not, then you'll still understand the, all of the talk, I think. But formally, what we often do is we um, try to maximize a mutual information um, between the sensory input and our internal representation of this, of this sensory input. And we can uh, decompose this as the entropy of the input minus the uh, conditional entropy of the input given the output. So how, how much uncertainty is there about the input to start with and how much uncertainty is there about the input given our internal representation, like which neurons in our visual cortex are how active, so to speak. And if we uh, assume that the amount of information is often constant or typically constant and we can also get rid of this first term here and only focus on this one which basically tells you okay given the internal representation that I have how much uncertainty is there left about what is out there in the world and so this has been a great success story because people have developed these sparse coding algorithms and what they do is you feed them with little patches from these natural images and then they learn and uh, before long they have figured out a representation that um, has m many features of what you see in primary visual cortex. You see these little units here that are like cells in visual cortex and have these Gabor-shaped uh, receptive fields. Um, and this has been a great success at the time and so there's a whole cottage industry of developing these models, improving these models, applying them to all sorts of sensory systems, and that has been uh, good stuff for, for many years now. Um, and just to 
um, dive a little bit deeper into this, uh, what we do with these sparse coding algorithms or with these sparse coding models, say we want to represent a patch of an input image that we see, we uh, formally represent it as a linear superposition of basis functions. So the basis functions phi here are these receptive fields that we learn essentially and we're trying to approximate a given piece of input by activating these basis functions with different weights. So the phi here would correspond to roughly speaking the receptive fields of neurons and the AI here would be uh, the activities of these neurons. So it's a, it's a generative model for how to code visual information uh, with some, some sparse code, with some units uh, of which uh, only a few are supposed to be active. And um, there are two, two terms that play a role here, sparsity and overcompleteness. Sparsity means that for any particular patch we are only want to activate a few of these neurons to save energy, but in order to still have a faithful representation, we want to have many of these neurons to choose from, many basis functions available, and that's often called overcompleteness, that you have more uh, neurons here available as the input has dimensions, and that might explain why you have so many more neurons in visual cortex compared to the incoming fibers from the uh, LGN. Now, so this is sort of what I call the traditional view and it basically says, well, look at the statistics of these signals and um, learn an efficient code for representing these signals. But what it's lacking is that we really shape the statistics of these signals all the time by virtue of our own behavior. In the simplest thing in the simplest form through our eye movements. And what that really means is that if you want to encode the world efficiently, you can mess around with, well, the kinds of neurons and receptive fields they have here, but you can also try to optimize uh, your encoding of the world by adapting your behavior. And that's what we call uh, active efficient coding. So learn to how you can use your behavior to make your encoding of the world more efficient. And we've been developing this from the beginning with Bert Shi. He's a neuromorphic engineer from uh, Hong Kong. And many postdocs and PhD students have been working on these topics, collaborators from medicine and engineering. And many of these people now have their own professorships uh, across, across the world. So, I can't give you the whole story of it here, um, but we have used these ideas to do a whole bunch of things, and the ones in red are what I'm going to talk about. I'll give you first the original example of how you can learn about binocular vision, disparity tuning, and virgins eye movements with these uh, approaches, how you can uh, extend this to do smooth pursuit, and in the end I'll go a little bit more in the cognitive direction and explain to you how the very same general principle, general idea, can also give rise to imitation behaviors. But there are other things that uh, we're working on, or we have done, um, that we can all explain or understand in the same framework. So this is maybe the most important slide of it all. It's sort of a, a cartoon simplified version of how all these models work. So if you've understood the logic of this, and it's very simple, uh, then we can all sleep uh, happily ever after and maybe do some consolidation during sleep with a little bit of replay. Um, so the way the generic active efficient coding model works is that you have sensory input, illustrated here by two eyes, you learn um, with a sparse coding model or some other form of efficient coding how to represent these sensory signals in an effective fashion. 
Um, but then you also need to generate behavior, so we're going to have a reinforcement learner. And thankfully, uh, I don't have to explain reinforcement learning anymore because uh, Fred and Frederick and uh, Bidi have done a terrific job of explaining all this. So we're going to have a reinforcement learner that generates uh, model commands, in particular how to move the eyes. And we're, the tricky thing is now, or the, the interesting innovation is, what is the reinforcement signal here? And what we've postulated a couple of years ago is that the brain should be using a reinforcement signal that rewards efficient coding of the input. And this supposed, from hypothesized, theoretically predicted uh, reinforcement signal should be or is generated by the system itself. So it's not some reward that comes from the outside, like right, the animal uh, being given food or, or water when it's thirsty, but it's an intrinsically generated uh, reward. So it's a form of intrinsically motivated learning um, and is in line with sort of other forms of intrinsically motivated learning uh, as proposed by many people, for example, on, on curiosity drives. But it's not the same as curiosity he drive here. It's what we're proposing is an intrinsic motivation for coding efficiency. And what it will do for us, it will allow us to build fully self-calibrating active perception systems. So that's sort of the basic idea sparse coding plus reinforcement learning where the reinforcement signal is internally generated to reward coding efficiency of the system. So I'm going to explain to you how with that we can for example explain how an infant learns to uh, do binocular 3D vision and do these virgin's eye movements or start tracking objects around because it just realizes in fact that this is the most efficient way of dealing with the data. So binocular vision. So you may have uh, seen or may know that the information that comes from the two eyes is sort of kept in separate pathways until here it comes together in primary visual cortex where the information from the left and the right eye first converges onto individual neurons. So in visual cortex, we have sitting uh, neurons that will look um, at one part of the retina of one eye and a part of the retina of the other eye. And often, they look at different parts of one retina versus the other. And this difference we call disparity tuning. So to uh, give you a concrete example here, so this a particular cell here might have a receptive field in the left eye and a receptive field in the right eye. They will have these Gabor shapes, but they may be shifted a little bit relative to each other. So these neurons register small differences in the images in the left and the right eye. Um, and those uh, cells, in fact, exist in different brain areas and the disparities that they detect, uh, they can detect cover a broad range also depending on uh, whether this neuron is rep representing something in the central visual field or somewhere in the periphery. Um, now, we know that these tuning properties of these neurons are a product of experience. There are classic experiments already from the 1970s that if, say, you raise a kitten in such a striped experiment, when then you'll find in its visual cortex many cells that like to look at vertical edges, but barely any cells that like to see horizontal edges. So the whole learning process that we want to explain, or how the sensory representation here comes about, we think this is sort of a form of statistical learning, and this is what these sparse coding models can do for us. And the other part that needs to be explained, well, is the behavior, the virgin's eye movements that I showed you, uh, how these signals uh, or the activities of these neurons are now turned into rotations of the eyes to 
fixate objects and look at the same point with, with both eyes. So we're going to study this in the full uh, perception action cycle where we start with binocular images and depending on how you move your eyes they'll have certain statistics you'll learn a representation uh, you'll learn about disparity tuning um, and then um, through this postulated reinforcement signal for coding efficiency we're going to learn virgins control and as you change your versions control, you'll change the statistics of the binocular images and so forth. And we'll see where this loop will end up in the end. So we've been doing this with various platforms. Um, one that sort of allows certain degree of biological realism is this uh, in um, yeah. Um, musculo-mechanical simulation done in OpenSim of all the human extraocular eye muscles. So you can start pulling on these muscles and the eyes will turn around and we can use this for example to also model you know, paresis of a particular muscle and things like that. Um, and here's now sort of what one concrete model might look like. It, it's still sort of a simplified caricature and I'm not going to show you any equations, but you have an agent that looks at objects that are presented at different uh, distances from it. It can uh, sense uh, the world through two eyes um, and we're distinguishing of fine scale and, and coarse scale here in green and um, and yellow where we have these sparse coders that try to now learn a code for these uh, visual information, um, learn these uh, binocular receptive fields, um, these, the activity of these uh, neurons in the visual cortex gets mapped onto an actor critic reinforcement learning system. You've already heard about how that works in principle and I just want to emphasize that what exact sparse coding algorithm you use here and what exact reinforcement learning algorithm you use here I don't think it matters much. We've played with different kinds of algorithms. The principle is always the same and it always tends to work um, unless you do something very wrong. Yes? I would be interested about the exact reinforcement signal. Yes. What is the parity across the whole image? So since this is a generative model, um, a good proxy for this mutual information under the assumption that the amount of information that is here in these images is sort of the same is just a reconstruction error. So how well from your internal representation can you reconstruct the input? So it's basically the way I would I envision it neurally is basically looking at what comes into layer 4 of visual cortex, uh, looking at what code you activate in layer 2, 3, and looking at how well the sort of projections back from or from the layer 2, 3 activity you could basically reconstruct what's coming into layer 4. So since the information is um, separate initially between the two eyes, this is, oops, this is the first stage um, where things come together and the reconstruction error will really be that of uh, reconstructing the individual one dimension, the, the individual left and right images from the binocular code that you learn here. Does that answer your question? Patch by patch, and then you just sum over all the patches. Oh, well, because you have foveation, right? So you, you sample the central part of the image with higher resolution, and so it's much more important for you to get that part reconstructed well. So we don't, in fact, we don't have an attention mechanism in here, but that would uh, sort of allow you to, you know, further 
constrain what you really want to reconstruct. Okay, so here I already show you the behavior that the system has learned. And the way I show it is through a so-called anaglyph, where we basically superimpose the image that comes to the left and to the right in, as different color channels into a single image. So whenever the eyes are looking at something different, you see these color fringes, but wherever it's gray, basically the two eyes are well aligned and the pixels that the left eye sees correspond to the pixels that the right eye sees. This is the behavior after learning and you can't probably read this number here but it gives you a level of accuracy and it basically tells you that this simple system has now learned to do these virgins eye movements with sub-pixel accuracy. And what I find cool about this is that we didn't really tell the system that it should learn about disparity or that it should make these virgins eye movements. The only thing we told it is encode the information as efficiently as you can and here are some motor degrees of freedom that you have. Use them uh, to help with that. And the system then basically discovered on its own that there is such a thing as disparity and that it can use its virgin's eye movements to, in the end, learn a more efficient code. Um, yeah, and then right, if you look at the model and look at these binocular basis functions that it has learned, you find what you would also expect to find in the, in the brain. There are cells that are tuned to zero disparity that basically want to look at the same thing in the left and right eye or that have non-zero disparity preferences and you see some monocular cells that want to see some structure in one eye but don't care what's in the other eye. So the sort of a range of things that you would also find in, in visual cortex. In, in this solution, yeah. You also just predicate on your library of images that you have explored. So if I would to say to learn train the system in an environment of very specific spatial frequencies, let's say. We'll get to that. Ah, okay. But well, you agree that at this stage that's a challenge now. You have to, you have to solve it or, or no. Um well, let's revisit that question later. Um, so, one question you might ask is how robust is this? So, here's a version that we've studied already many years ago where we then you know, made one image blurry or rotated it or turned one eye to the side or turned one eye up, upwards a little bit to see would the system still be able to deal with this and have some of the robustness that we expect from biological systems. And here are essentially the learning curves. So how accurate will the behavior be as a function of time for these different situations? And you see it, it typically degrades gracefully. It won't reach the same kind of performance as the con control system in gray down here usually, but it will still somewhat work and just you know lose a little bit of accuracy. The one case where it doesn't seem to have any uh, decrement in accuracy is where when I turn one eye off to the side a little bit horizontally and that's because in this situation the system, the model, can use its own motor degree of freedom the virgin's eye movements that it generates to fully compensate for this disturbance. So any sort of uh, disturbance um, that it can compensate for with its motor degrees of freedom, it will happily learn to use that to compensate for it. And then you can test it on the real robot as well. Um, another test of robustness if you like. What we did here is we basically just used the model that was trained all in simulation and ran it on the robot without any additional retraining. So it's not um, you see actually that there's a little bit of a vertical misalignment and a rotational misalignment between the cameras. But, so it's not perfect, but it essentially works and does the right thing. Um, and right, you see basically grayish here and maybe on the, around the edges and because of the rotations it, it's not perfect, but it uh, essentially learns to as you see here in slow motion, correctly uh, bring the two uh, eyes into alignment. Yes? Uh, 
Well, it's about coding efficiency, and if you um, align both eyes on the same point, then the two images become more redundant, so you can compress the information more efficiently. You can encode the information more compactly that way. Um, so, Paul asked about alternate rearing conditions. What happens if you, you know, now raise this in the different environments with different kinds of images? Of course, we've uh, also uh, played with this a little bit and tried to reproduce some of these kinds of experiments by yeah, essentially putting uh, blur filters on the images of one camera or both cameras to simulate having mostly access to vertical or horizontal edges. And we can basically um, reproduce a whole bunch of findings from the biological literature on how this will affect the development of binocular vision. Here's just some example images uh, where here you mostly see have vertical edges left or mostly have horizontal edges left. And um, this leads to systematic changes in what kinds of receptive fields you see how often that right when you have mostly vertical edges left then m most of the cells in your simulated visual cortex will also have a uh, tuning uh, preferred tuning for vertical edges or horizontal edges or if right you uh, do crazy things with or orthogonal uh, or do monocular deprivation, then yes, you'll see many more monocular cells in the visual cortex. And I'm not going into the details here, but this is in line with a whole zoo of experiments that people have done over the last 30 or so years. And we can, let me just skip that, um, look at this statistically, but you, you got the basic idea, I think. So this was virgins um, and disparity tuning. So the same model now essentially will also kind of for free give you the ability to track moving objects around with the same idea that if I keep moving my eyes and hold them on the same stimulus then I create redundancies in the visual input uh, successive images end up being very correlated, redundant and I can compress the information, encode the information more compactly so we have a learning environment now where there's an uh, a infant robot that sees objects in front of it that move in 3D. Okay? And um, the model very much uh, looks what we've seen before. Uh, the basis functions that we learn now also have a temporal component, so they encode left and right and T minus 1 and T, so they can also encode motion. Um, we learn sparse coding dictionaries. We have an actor critic reinforcement learner that now not just only um, controls the virgins degree, degree of freedom but also pen and tilt degrees of freedom. So this can sort of look around um, in whatever it, it, it pleases. And um, you see it, it works here sort of again the accuracy of these virgins um, and pursuit movements in pen and tilt direction as a function of time. The system here again reaches sub-pixel accuracy and this is just a, a video of what that looks like. Um, here you see it's a little bit bad in the contrast. You see the eyes moving. This is the third person view. You see the robot and how the object moves. And this is again this anaglyph what the robot sees with the cameras. And you see it's sort of trying to stabilize this object because it has figured out that this is the most efficient way to represent the sensory input. Um, so you might ask what limits the performance of such a system because right, it starts with no prior knowledge essentially and then uh, self-calibrates to do these accurate movements. Um, basically, so we've looked at different systems here that um, for example have no fine scale sparse coder, so they have poor image resolution, or that uh, have a coarse action set, they have poor motor resolution, and 
if you compare that to the standard system, you get some loss in performance here just for the virgin's degree of freedom. So there's sort of, you give it poor image resolution, poor motor resolution, it won't be as accurate. Um, but also, if you make its internal coding capacity, uh, if you limit this by reducing the size of the sparse coding dictionary, eventually you will also get losses in performance. So these systems self-calibrate until they hit one of three limits, the image resolution that they have with their cameras, the motor resolution, or another limit that is induced by their internal coding capacity, which makes perfect sense. Okay, um, final point I want to make is it, right, we've been talking about super low level skills, right? Calibrating some eye movements. I'm sure we can do more with this, but the sort of most cognitive thing um, is this connection to imitation learning. Um, so this is quite a bit of a jump. So let me give you just a minute of background here. Um, many of you may be familiar with the zebra finch system, which is sort of what neuroscientists, is one of their favorite model systems for studying language learning as good as it's possible it, in the animal world. So these male zebra finches, they learn a song typically from their father. So right, when they grow up, they listen to their father and in the end imitate the same song. And that is a, a process that uh, takes uh, a couple of months to develop. Um, there's a sensory phase where they don't really um, do any vocalizations themselves, but they're just listening, and that overlaps with the sensory motor phase where they listen to the father's song but start making their own uh, vocalizations. Uh, and in the end, they have basically learned the song of the father. Um, now, how is this related to this idea of active efficient coding? Well, it's actually quite simple. If you think of this uh, young zebra finch that initially listens to what the father's song sounds like and learns an internal model of that song, maybe with quite similar kind of sparse coding ideas for learning a representation of the acoustic information. So it, it learns how to encode this song. And now it starts generating its own vocalizations. So if it generates a vocalization that is very dissimilar from the father song, well, it will be hard to encode, right? Because the statistical model of sound that it has learned is attuned to what it has heard from the, from the father uh, bird. Uh, so active efficient coding would predict a low reward or negative reward uh, for making this kind of vocalization. But if you produce a song that sounds more like what the father's song sounds like, it will be easy to encode. Right? It matches your statistical model. Um, so that would be associated with a positive reward. So um, vocalizations that m match the father's um, vocalizations are easier to encode and an intrinsic reward signal for efficient coding will therefore reinforce vocalizations that resemble those of the parents. So this idea of an intrinsically uh, generated reward for efficient coding could in this kind of setup easily uh, also give rise to imitative behaviors. And we've done some modeling in this direction, but um, I think this is enough to just you know, get the basic idea across. So, um, yeah, so that already brings me to the end. So, a, we're ready for lunch. Um, active efficient coding, the idea is move your sense organs to make sensory encoding as efficient as possible. Um, you can use this to self calibrate a range of eye movements, virgins, pursuit, optokinetic nystagmus, torsion, accommodation movements. We do things on bed echolocation with the same approach. Uh, and yeah, we can, so it also generalizes to other modalities. And I'm just 
uh, highlighted a possible connection to imitation learning even. And uh, with that, I'd like to, yeah, okay. thank you and acknowledge the funding agencies.